apologies and welcome again to everyone who's just arrived to uh, tonight's Access Wednesday event, the Book of Hours uh, Reflections on Chronic Illness, Contemporary Art, Anglo-Saxon Hermits and the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills with the unmissable Letty McHugh. So, as I say, this is actually the very last event in our body season, which has been running throughout the whole of July. Um, you've noticed perhaps that we are in webinar format, so as well as the chat not working for some reason, uh, it also means that your cameras are switched off and your mics are on mute, which means that you can get on with uh, whatever, whatever you might like to, uh, to do while we do it, just listen, listen along to, to what's going on uh, here. It's great to have you with us. Um, it's been such a great month so far, and I can't believe that we're already sort of coming towards the end of July. Um, uh, we've had some great events. Let me just show you a few of the things that we've had going on. So in the first week, we had Priya Mystery taking uh, us through uh, how our bodies can remember trauma. Uh, we also took a peek at what artists wear with Charlie Porter. And then last week, we learned some new skills to gain equilibrium and balance from radical self-care to collective well-being with Kajal Nisha Patel. If anybody was not at those events but would like to see uh, to see them, watch them again, they are available on our YouTube channel, as will tonight's talk be a little bit after the event. So yeah, if you'd like to catch up on that in your own time, please feel free. I think they were both well worth a watch. And then before we get into tonight's uh, show in, in earnest, just wanted to let you know about uh, our next season of events, which is coming in September, back to school with Axis. Uh, these just went live today. So you are now able to start uh, registering if you would like to. So our aim with these uh, is to, so it's basically, so every day is a school day. Like it's not just the kids who are gonna be going back to the classroom in September. We wanted everyone to feel that they could enjoy that back to school feeling. Um, and so we're gonna be giving some workshops, masterclasses for freelancers and other creative professionals. Um, hopefully dealing with some of the kind of, you know, common challenges and, and difficulties that lots of people face in that work. So kicking off the month, we will have Fundraising 101 with Ash Beaumont and Laura Sweeney of The Uncultured. Uh, the Uncultured are an organisation with an incredible track record in helping people to secure funding for their art projects, uh, especially uh, Arts Council uh, project grants and DYCP uh, pr projects. Uh, so they'll be sharing all their best tips and tricks for making your application stand out in what is undeniably a very crowded market. Uh, and they'll also be answering any questions that you might have about the fundraising process. Then the following week on the 21st of September, we've got Benita Walia, uh, who is uh, an amazing um, PR sort of guru in the arts. Uh, she'll be uh, talking about PR and marketing for artists who are working on a budget, on a shoestring budget, essentially. Um, so she has a lots of experience of helping artists to share their work on various media platforms. Um, so I think her guidance is going to be really invaluable for anyone who is looking to make the most of their next project and reach as many people as possible. So do sign up for that. And then on September 28th, the Uncultured will be back with us with another workshop, this time looking at budgeting for artists and art businesses. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I just find writing budgets probably the worst part of any kind of project grant. I absolutely, I'm just baffled by numbers. So um, I think this one's going to be really, really useful. It's going to look at how to write a budget, how to manage a budget, all the stuff that you need to know around, around sort of dealing with finances for art projects and funded projects. So yeah, sign up for that. And then there is a date we haven't yet confirmed with our very own Access Web social media manager, Madalena Kay, who's gonna be talking about an artist guide to social media. So Madalena has like 30,000 followers on social media. She knows her stuff. So this one's really good for anyone, again, like me, who's not that great at social media stuff and would like to kind of grow their audience a little bit. So just keep an eye out for the date being confirmed on that one. It'll probably be towards the end. Um, these events are free to Axis members. Uh, if you are an Axis member, 
you'll be getting an email in the next few days with a promotional code, a secret code that you can use to get the ticket for free. So don't book now, even if you're really keen, we'll make sure there's plenty of tickets available for Access members. If you are not a member, there is a small fee attached to, um, to, 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 to signing up. So get signing up now if you're not a member. But if you're not a member, why are you not a member? <laughs> um, to let you know about Access We Are, a membership organisation, a small but friendly arts charity run by artists for artists. And there are loads of great reasons why you should join us, including the very best deals in public liability insurance, uh, which is something that we all need now that so many things are kind of returning to public spaces again, post pandemic. Um, membership uh, starts at about £1.75 and you can find out everything you need to know on our website www.accessweb.org. I will share the link in the chat in a moment. And that just leaves me with the great pleasure um, of introducing you to tonight's speaker, Letty McHugh. I have been absolutely raving about her project, The Book of Hours, uh, ever since I read it a few weeks back. And I'm so, so delighted that Letty has uh, agreed to come and share it with us all tonight in the Axis Book Club. Just to say, uh, we will be having a Q&A at the end. So as Letty's speaking, if you have any questions that you'd like me to return to or us to return to in the Q&A at the end, just put them into the Q&A as you've already identified the chat is not working for some reason so if you can put stuff into the q a i was going to ask you to do it anyway but that's great that's just making it even easier any questions that you might have and we will return to as many as we possibly can at the end we're looking at a, a, about an hour in total for tonight's event maybe about half an hour to 45 minutes from letty and then we'll get on to some questions so um let me hand over to Letty, who's a fantastic artist, whose biography, I'm afraid, I have not managed to, to, to recall. So Letty, please could you introduce yourself and, uh, and I'll share all the links needed in the chat now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lucy. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Letty McHugh. I am an artist and writer based in West Yorkshire. I describe myself as like artist slash writer slash multidisciplinary enigma because my work just can't be contained by any single media. Um, I've worked in traditional textiles, uh, different forms of writing. I've started experimenting in film and audio work. Um, and I'm here today to talk about my recent project, Book of Hours. So the plan is that I'll kind of explain the idea behind the project to you, um, how it came about, and then I'll do a bit of a reading from the project book. Uh, and then as Lucy said, we'll have a bit of time for questions at the end. So thanks everyone for joining today. Um, so my project, Book of Hours, started back in early 2020. So to give you the full backstory, at the beginning of 2020, I had just been made associate artist with Disability Arts Online. Um, and I had lots of exciting plans about the work that I was gonna make in like over the course of my associateship and what the future of my practice was gonna look like. And then of course, we all know what happened, the pandemic started and all of my ideas had kind of involved travel um, and so I was adapting to this new updated reality where all my work was going to have to be based on ideas that I could execute while unable to leave the house and um, because I live with multiple sclerosis and I take immunosuppressants so even on top of it being locked down um, I've been kind of clinically vulnerable throughout the whole pandemic. Um, so on top of that, uh, if you all cast your minds back to 2020, we're stuck inside, the world is stressful, we don't know what's happening. Um, I also had an experience where I had a flare-up of symptoms of my MS. So what happened was my um, immune system started attacking the retina in this eye. And I recognized it quite quickly because I've had it before, but um, obviously at the, all, I couldn't go to hospital. So I couldn't get it checked out. I couldn't get maybe some of the acute medication that would usually be available to me. 
and I found myself um, alone in the guest room of my parents' house for like a three week period because one of the side effects of this period of ill health was a symptom called photophobia. And what photophobia means is that it, it literally hurts to look at light. Like you've probably noticed my glasses, this is to kind of help with the long-term side effects of that relapse basically. So I had this three week period um, where I was in quite a lot of pain and the world was really scary. And I was sleeping for maybe 15 to 20 hours a day. Um, and in the hours that I was awake, it was quite a uh, blurry, uncomfortable time. I had the curtains shut. And I can remember there was this one particular afternoon that was really tough to get through. And I write about this in the book, um, is this idea that when you live with conditions that can cause chronic pain, sometimes it's hard to see, you have these moments where it's hard to see beyond the borders of that pain, right? It's hard to see past the particular moment that you're stuck in. Um, so it can become quite difficult to kind of reflect on how am I gonna survive this? Because it's kind of almost like a panicky feeling um, where you can't see to even like five minutes later, where it's, you know, how am I gonna cope for the rest of this afternoon even? when it just hurt, like my eye hurts so much. Um, and so that's kind of the headspace I was in when I came up for the idea of this project, because what happened was I remembered um, this concept of medieval books of hours. And my understanding of them at, at that time was a little bit fuzzy, um, but what I understood them to be were prayer books like these beautiful if you imagine like a medieval manuscript there's all like gold covers there's like swirly um marginalia um, and this is what I started imagining and they had in them prayers for every hour of the day every day of the year um and so late there on the afternoon I started thinking I really wish I had a book of hours to tell me what to think about that isn't just my eye hurts um, and so I started imagining one to kind of picture something else, right? Uh, but I still did, I didn't want a literal medieval prayer book because I didn't really want like reflections on Jesus and the crucifixion. I wanted something for people like me. So kind of um, lost, <laughs> confused uh, artists in their late 20s who don't really know what they're doing and like maybe a bit more fun maybe a bit more humorous um but just something that's like this is what you can think about when you're so ill that you don't know what to think about um and so that was the idea that was when I first had the idea for the project book of hours and I also started reflecting on that same afternoon I remembered um so in my childhood, I went on a lot of holidays to the Northeast. And I spent a lot of time in the area around Holy Island, Lindisfarne. And if you don't know it, it's this really beautiful, isolated tidal island where there's a famous uh, old wrecked priory. Um, and I spent a lot of time there as a kid, kind of going on walks. And it was this really peaceful place. And I remembered this figure called St. Cuthbert who lived on Linda's farm. And he was a hermit. Um, and on that particular afternoon, I also became really intrigued by this idea of hermits because what I was really struggling with was isolation. And I started really thinking that somebody like St. Cuthbert who deliberately isolated themselves like they must have some kind of secret, I thought, on the afternoon about how to survive as a human <laughs> um, and how to survive. I just thought if I could come to understand him and understand people like him who isolate themselves on purpose, they would be able to give me some kind of insight into how I could survive as a chronically ill person. So that was the other element of the project. So I started imagining myself on Linda's farm as a hermit, um, living the perfect life. I was going to recover. This is what I decided. I would recover from my MS relapse 
And then I would dedicate myself to art in the way that an early Christian hermit was dedicated to God. So none of my suffering would matter anymore once I was better because I would just be working away on my mission to make a book of hours, like a secular book of hours for people like me. Um, and that would help me overcome everything. And I particularly became interested in faith as a topic, but not in faith as in... So when I was thinking about St. Cuthbert, I wasn't interested in what he believed in. I was interested in how he found the kind of inner resolve to keep believing. Um, and that was all the early thoughts that kind of coagulated into the beginning of this project book of ours. Um, and I thought of a good way to explain this the other day. So I was thinking, because I think when you are living with a chronic illness, like I do, part of the secret to getting through a bad day is faith and it's not faith in anything in particular it's faith in the idea that you're going to get to another day where it doesn't hurt so and a good example of this I think is at the start of this week when it was really hot and we were having the heat wave at the start of last week it's Monday now isn't it um my MS symptoms often flare up in the heat so the the days of the heat wave were really rough for me physically uh and I got through them by having faith that at the end of the heat wave, there would be this beautiful thunderstorm. And I was laying on like Monday, Tuesday afternoon, picturing, because I love a thunderstorm, picturing the rain, picturing the sound of the thunder, picturing that sudden shift in the air and the smell. And I really kept faith in that thunderstorm. And of course, here in West Yorkshire, when it did finally cool down, we never got that thunderstorm. But it didn't really matter then because the, all I had needed was something to believe in to get me through that rough afternoon. Um, so that's how I became quite interested in the start of the project in kind of Lindisfarne, the lives of those early monks, because I was thinking that like I could become a secular art monk was my life plan. Um, so I thought that I would just read the description from the book that I give of St. Cuthbert, just so you know, you're on intimate terms with him like I am. Okay, so I'm gonna read now. St. Cuthbert, feast day, March 20th. St. Cuthbert was maybe a Briton or maybe a Saxon. He could have been a shepherd or a soldier who fought the Mercians, or he could have been both. We know that he had a vision that told him to go to Lindisfarne. We know that he was a famous hermit within his lifetime and that he was even more famous after his death. The oldest book in Britain is Cuthbert's Bible. It says, Cuthbert's book that fell into the sea on the opening page. He named his horse Comrade and shared all his meals with it. His best miracle was this. Cuthbert stepped onto land after walking ankle deep in seawater and two sea otters voluntarily used their fur to dry his feet. Cuthbert protected all the eider ducks on the Inner Farne Islands when he was Bishop of Lindisfarne and allowed them to nest inside the priory. In the Northeast, eider ducks are still known as cuddy ducks after this saint. As a kid on holiday on Lindisfarne, I was baffled how someone could live in the quietest, most peaceful place on earth and think, you know what this place could use? More windswept isolation. I used to think there must have been a monk on Lindisfarne with my personality. Some over the top chatterbox who could talk anyone further and further out to sea. Hey brother Cuddy, what do you think of my new vestment? Too much? I was talking to Brother John in the brewery just now, particularly good batch of mead on at the moment, FYI. Anyway, he said those vestments look a bit much. They could do with being a bit itchier, he said. And you know, more mortifying. And I said, listen, buddy, some of us can itch in style. And wait, Cuddy, where are you rowing to? Cuddy, there's nothing on the island. Reading about him now as an adult, I understand him. He wanted a quiet life, 
alone with his ducks. So that's kind of the introduction to the start of the project and St. Cuthbert. Um, and as the project developed, I started doing a lot of research. I get quite, uh, I have an enthusiast personality and I get quite obsessed with things and I do a lot of research. So this project developed with me researching the history of people being alone on purpose. So starting out with um, people like St. Cuthbert's who were hermits and moved to caves and isolated islands and then carrying on looking at um, more modern people. So I looked at Agnes Martin, um, who was an artist who disappeared and built herself um, a sort of modern day version of a hermitage in the uh, American desert. And I also started looking a lot at um, the idea of suffering and the idea of suffering for your art, because I think that's still quite prevalent in our society, this idea of bodily suffering. Um, and the, the project kind of developed through, I was working with Disability Arts Online, so I was having a lot of meetings with their um, editor, Colin Hambrook, and he was asking me, how was it, how was the project going? Um, and I was saying stuff like, oh, you know, I'm writing based on the cycle of the moon <laughs> because I was uh, I was trying to apply this discipline to my life, this discipline of a monk from Lindisfarne, but I'm an inherently undisciplined person. So I started out by, uh, and the first thing I was going to do was project an image of the Sistine Chapel onto my bedroom ceiling. And then I didn't do that um, because, you know, it's not a great idea. Uh, and then I started trying to, I discovered all this stuff about how uh, back in the ye olden days, um, their concept of time wasn't like our concept of time uh, because they didn't have clocks uh, in the way that we have clocks. Um, and it was much more like rhythmical and that kind of worked for me as an idea of like living on chronic illness time and listening to the rhythms of my body. So I started um doing the writing that was based on I would write for different times throughout the day based on um what period the moon was in like the lunar month um and those were kind of the little excerpt diary entries that got worked up um, and became this book um, I was very fortunate at the same time to be working with two really great mentors from my DYCP uh, Polly Atkin and Lucy Burnett, who helped me develop. Uh, so this collection ended up being lyric essay and poetry. Well, I'd never really written poetry until this last few years. Um, well, it was actually quite an interesting thing because um, I thought I'd never written poetry, but then these weird little fragments that I was writing, I found out counts poems. So that's quite exciting. Um, gone on a slight tangent. So what happened then as the project, I started to feel like it was really important uh, that I did some traveling. And I had this idea that Disability Arts Online were really supportive of that um, to fully develop this project of, you know, turning myself into a modern art hermit, I needed to go to Lindisfarne myself to develop the project um, and then I was really fortunate in that they supported me to go to the northeast for a week um, for a residency and to visit Lindisfarne and to do all this research uh, and I was really determined that the way to overcome physical suffering was through faith at this point in the project and that I was going to go to Lindisfarne and um, live like the monks of Lindisfarne did uh, and yeah so I thought that was you know the key moment in the project uh, and I wrote about it in the book so I'll read to you how it went um, and how the project developed afterwards it took it was quite a pivotal moment uh, In June 2021, I was given the opportunity to go 
on an artist retreat to Lindisfarne, a real life pilgrimage to find inner peace, solve the scattered jigsaw of my contradictory belief system and finally become a proper artist. I wasn't putting any pressure on the trip. Compromise began immediately when accommodation on Lindisfarne itself is unavailable until at least 2023. So I stay instead in sea houses with a distance view of Lindisfarne. If you leave the house and walk to the end of the street, still I am resolved that for the week I will live as a monk. I will keep to the schedule of the monks of Lindisfarne and pray at the eight watch times throughout the day. Only this is a modern and secular project. So I redefine praying as this, anything that opens my mind up to my heart, anything that opens my heart up to the hectic beauty of the endless universe. Still, I will only do things that are edifying and disciplined. The following things will count. Blind drawing, writing, looking at the sea, uh, sky or wildlife, reading poetry or creative nonfiction, and yoga, which I have never done before. I will not read fast-paced fantasy novels. I will not fall down Wikipedia wormholes. I will not spend hours scrolling social media. I will not watch any reality television. I am a monk. I sequester myself in a former fisherman's cottage with a pretty pink door on a ruddy little beach that falls away into the harbour. Um, I make pots of tea and Google the fish and chip shop opening times. On the first day, as a monk of Lindisfarne, I write four times. I do yoga twice. I don't do any blind drawing. I don't read any poetry. I do read the guest book and make up daft little stories for myself about other people's holidays. On the second day, I write twice, but in longer stints. Uh, better, I think, more concentrated, more disciplined. I do not do yoga. I do no blind drawing. I read no poetry. I walk round to the co-op to get breakfast. Uh, I get breakfast stuff for tea, pancakes, bacon, sausages, strawberries, this is my favorite tea. The monks of Lindisfarne, they trek themselves with a little bit of mead or whatever after a hard day of being pious. So I'm still being very disciplined. In the evening, I watch swallows flitting about the telegraph wires. I spend three hours reading about swallows and migratory patterns on Wikipedia. I'm convinced there's an excellent metaphor for faith in this somewhere. On the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Dorit Kimsley and Kyle Richard have an argument about their glam squads. On the third day, I write once in the morning, proper disciplined stuff about faith and feelings. I do not write again in the afternoon, but I do accidentally start something about a gutter snipe in Victorian Yorkshire who can steal shadows and weave them into illusions. And that's not very edifying or disciplined. So I delete it and it doesn't count in my official writing tally. I don't do yoga. I don't do blind drawing. I don't read any poetry. In the evening, I watch a boat bringing the National Trust staff from the inner farm Remember an episode of the seminal ITV murder mystery series Vera is set on the inner farm and try to decide who of this crew would be the killer um, based solely on their wellies. On the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Crystal and Sutton get into an argument that ends with Sutton screaming, Jealous of what? Your ugly leather pants? across Kathy Hilton's perfectly manicured lawn. On the fourth day, I don't write, draw, or do yoga. I don't read poetry. 
I set out to walk across the rocks to a small tidal island adjacent to Seahouses Harbour that has a small stone hut on it. I've spent nearly 20 years convinced this hut was St. Cuthbert's home itself. It isn't. As I'm scrambling up the final cluster of rocks, I start with migraine symptoms and have to turn back. Back in the cottage, I Google the little hut. I learn it was never a home itself. It was a powder house used for storing gunpowder away from the harbour. Slightly loopy from my acute medication, I read about a campaign to restore the powder house and a campaign to put a plaque on the powder house in honour of the woman who led the campaign to restore the powder house. I spend three hours reading the blog of a man who is visiting every island off the coast of Britain and Ireland. On The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Erica Girardi breaks down while telling Kyle Richard about her divorce. Erica Girardi is famously cold. It's unusual for her to display emotion on camera like this. I read several fan blogs that theorize she wore non-waterproof mascara deliberately to make her tears more visible and garner sympathy from the viewers. So you can kind of see that the trip did not quite go as I planned it. And um, I didn't live as a monk. Although I still maintain that if the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills had been available in the Anglo-Saxon period, that they all would have been watching it. Um, the part of that project, oh, sorry, let me start again. The project really changed after my trip to Sea Houses both because having called myself out on what I would do when actually living as a monk I discovered that I would just live the same life and just be the same person that I am but also because I learned a lot about what it was actually like as a monk on Linda's farm which was pretty cushy so I found out that um it was a really good, there, there was this period of history called the Golden Age of Northumbria. And it was a really good time to be a monk. Like they had really nice stuff. Um, like there's this record of this beautiful, um, like blue glass chess set, which is probably like in value equivalent, some of the stuff that the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills are product placing <laughs> on the show. You know, it's like the diamonds. The, the monks of Lindisfarne had great stuff and that's why they ended up famously getting raided by the Vikings because they had stuff worth nicking. Um, so then I had to kind of change the project I, and, and what I was writing and everything I'd planned had to become different because I had to then examine why I was disappointed to find out that the monks of Lindisfarne didn't live these lives of like simple dedication and self-denial and um this like I wanted them to be physically really suffering in order to be monks because I felt like that would give my suffering as a chronically ill person who's trying to make art meaning so I thought that I could learn something from that the imaginary version of the monks of Lindisfarne um, that would that would make my suffering worthwhile. And I thought that I could do that through art. And I actually, uh, I'm not gonna read any of this right now, but I, I write a lot in the book about kind of this suffer, this history of the relationship between art making and suffering and how we really put that suffering on a pedestal. And that's not really very healthy um, for me, particularly as a chronically ill artist. Um, I write about, uh so also before the pandemic I was supposed to be doing this um takeover at the Tate Exchange in London um with some other disabled artists uh that would have been March 2020 and uh, that was cancelled and I can remember getting ready for that I really pushed myself so my it did have a bit of a symptom flare-up and I also had like a horrible illness um and I was really suffering and I was doing you know like um uh had some gastric symptoms and was sat on my bathroom floor 
uh, being sick into the toilet and then getting my laptop out and carrying on working. And I, at the time, thought that was like really, I kind of thought that was glamorous. I thought that was a good way for an artist to be because like, look how dedicated I am. That really kind of grind culture. Um, so then when I went to Lindisfarne and both realized A, that monks had a pretty nice time um, and B, that even when the circumstances were absolutely perfect and I was in a cottage by the sea with no distractions, I still found distractions and I still watched The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills at every given opportunity. Um, and so I had to kind of unpick that. Uh, and that's when the project kind of developed and I started looking at, because I was still trying to understand how people find resilience in times of hardship. Um, and through the process of kind of keeping writing and making the work. Uh, so as part of this project, I've also made um, an installation called Anchorage, which is my own anchorites were like hermits. So they lived in a cell. Um, so I made my own version using a polytunnel frame. It's uh, four meters long and three meters wide. This textile installation called Anchorage, which is kind of my answer of what would my Anchorage look like if I was an artist, but you can never actually go inside it because um, is there is no perfect place to be chronically ill. There is no perfect place to be an artist. So an anchorage is kind of inherently imaginary. Um, and kind of through that revelation, I think I thought that I could reach somewhere. I really wanted to reach a place where my illness wouldn't matter anymore. Like I'd still be physically suffering. I knew I couldn't cure myself, but like, my faith in art would help me transcend and I would just make all this, be like really disciplined and make all this beautiful art. Um, and I had to kind of really start examining that. Um, and I started reflecting on joy in the project. So I started thinking about the things that actually get me through hard times, which isn't really these kind of grandiose ideas. Um, but it's tiny little things like when I talked about before about the thunderstorm or I talked about um, one of the things I often picture on a on a tough afternoon is um, in the summer uh, I have a little yard and I've got a lavender bush in it and some of my favorite days are when I sit on the bench in my little yard and the lavender bush is out and all these bees come into my yard um, so sometimes when I'm on well, I'll be laying in bed and I'll, I'll picture those bees. And I actually have, like my bed cover has bees on to kind of remind me of that. Um, so there was this idea that I talked about in the beginning of the project called the illness place. Um, and the idea of the illness place is that it's this kind of third space that you enter when you're ill and you're alone. Um, and you go there in your head. Um, and the revelation that I had through making this project is the things that were really the hardest part of being in the illness place were the things that I took in with me, the ideas from outside. Um, but then towards the end of the project, I, I started to realize that um, the solutions, the good things, the things that made my life easier to cope with being in the illness place were also the things that I took in with me. Um, and I started to understand, uh, I guess that I make my own meaning. So I started, this project started as a quest for meaning um, and how other people found meaning. And I kind of realized that, that I make my own meaning. So why did I think about St. Cuthbert on that first afternoon? Well, because I'd been on holiday to Lindisfarne a lot as a kid and I knew that story and I had this running joke with my brothers that I was the kind of person who would be chatty enough to drive a monk to go from a deserted island and be like just here with these 30 monks is not alone enough I need to go over there <laughs> like I would I would do that um and so so that that the reason it was a solution was because of me because I already knew about it and kind of from that perspective, it didn't really matter anymore. 
that um, I was watching The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills because, of course, I'm capable of creating profound meaning out of anything I want. I can make anything mean anything when I'm alone in a room. Um, and like maybe there's lessons to be learned from uh, ugly leather pants. <laughs> um, and so it became about thinking of like, what if as an artist, I replaced putting suffering on this pedestal to um, putting small joys, self-care, being kind to myself as the like thing to aspire towards. Um, and I started, I guess, just trying to store up little things to take. Because I knew that's the thing about being chronically ill is that I know my condition I will have another relapse I will have another period where I'm in the illness place on my own for a day for a week for a month I know that's coming um and it was kind of about then what can I do that's just going to make that a little bit easier on some days um and that's when I started looking at um small joys uh, and then this is the final poem that I'm going to read now is the, the last poem in the book. Um, Count it all joy. My neighbor's cat hitting the doormat with his eclectic thunder, a bag of chips from the fish shop, a book of farm food vouchers, a single glove. My grandma cutting the buttons of her blouses, stashing them in an old sweet tin in the loft alongside 20 suitcases of assorted fabric she brought home when she worked on the market. You never know what might come in for something. I'm saving up tiny joys, the way a bear fattens up for the coming winter, a patchwork quilt of ordinary leftover happiness to keep me warm through the darkest part of the night. Uh, yes, yeah, so I that's the final poem in the book. And I think that became about that epitome of that thing I said of trying to save up joys. But I also think uh, the subtitle of this project is Book of Hours, an almanac for the seasons of the soul. And I guess that's just what I wanted to kind of end by saying is uh, I think a proper book of hours, a real book of hours is about the rhythms of, of a year and the different seasons we go through. And I think I wanted to make some space in this project to acknowledge that, um, you know, it doesn't kind of end in a bright, happy place where I'm joyful forever. I will go back to having a hard time, but it's just about trying to create a piece of work that can be with you wherever you're at. Um, I started out by trying to make faith to find connection in times of isolation. Uh, and it, it feels quite apt to be doing this on a Zoom webinar format because this is what it feels like for me a lot of the time as an artist. I'm here in this little art room on my own and I'm making work and I'm talking. And the thing about Zoom webinar is you you can't see what really from me as the presenter, whether anybody's there or not. So um, I guess that's what I've learned about in this project is that for me, I have faith in art and I have faith in, it's having that faith that there's someone else out there on the other side of the screen, on the other side of the page of your book and trying to make something. Uh, if I go back to that very first afternoon when I had the idea for Book of Hours, I wanted to survive that relapse and make something because I imagined another person being in the scenario that I was in. And I was like, maybe I can learn something to make, and I, then I can make a piece of art and make it easier for them. So I think it's having that faith and connection um, for me. And that this is what that feels like all the time. Like you're making work and you're putting it out there. Um, just thank you for being here in this experience with me. Uh, I'm going to hand back over to Lucy now and see if we've got any 
any questions, but thank you for listening to the talk. Oh, thank you so much, Letty. That was gorgeous. And we're getting some really nice little reactions coming through from people who've been enjoying all of your words. Um, we do have a few questions. So I have a question as well. I'm hoping there'll be time for, but um, I'm going to just kick off with a question from Pam Newell, uh, who says, your example of faith in a better day really resonates with me, a fellow MSer. I'm wanting to chat despite wipeout. wipeout. Is it sheer force of personality that keeps that faith alive or can you identify faith mindset good habits? Oh, that's quite interesting. Um, I, I mean, to a certain extent, sheer force of personality is the main driving force in my life, <laughs> is the main tool that I'm working with. But I think, I think when I look back now at that really rough afternoon in 2020, I had faith that I didn't appreciate at the time. So when I think about, I felt really bleak and I felt like I wish I had faith in something, right? But I obviously did have faith in something because I had the idea for this project and I had faith in making this project. Um, and I think it's just about finding whatever little chink there is. I do think it helps to make the effort to find stuff on a good day that might be useful on a bad day. Um, but I think it's also about that thing I said towards the end of kind of being more open to the fact that there are going to be bad days um and yeah I, I guess I still I wish there was a secret to how you get through that um but part of what I learned in this project especially when I did look at one of the big revelations like oh St. Cuthbert he's just the same as me he's just a guy doing his best in a weird little cave somewhere um and that at times was really hard but it was also really liberating just to be like well everybody's just doing their best I think I don't I yeah, I wish there was a secret that I could say to you, this is how to get through a tough MS relapse and this is how to find faith in a better day. Um, but I guess it's, uh, there isn't one other than to say that I, I think it comes when you need it. I think you'll find it. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think that we only ever really see, or we generally see only the outsides of other people. And we don't always know when they're also struggling. So we have this perception that everybody else is handling things so much better than we are. And so that kind of, yeah, that understanding that everybody is kind of struggling or in different ways at different times and that we're not uniquely bad at dealing with difficulties is, is quite a, a nice thing too, maybe. Yes, absolutely. We've had a few questions um, of a similar nature. So Mary Fletcher said, I hope you'll show some pages of your book. And Tian has said, will you show some images of the anchorage or of your residency? And we've also had Annie has said, I noticed there are images in your book of ours. Are these pieces of work that you made alongside the writing? So I did wonder, do you have any images from the book? I know it's not ideal to show them on the camera. Um, I think, yeah, so I kind of hold the book up. Yeah. Um, some of them there's one. <laughs> I'm finding an image page. Uh, so the images in the book um, kind of came, they were the last thing that I made uh, as part of the project. Sort of a peacock feather, if anyone uh, needs a description. Um, and they came from, um, so it's quite handy actually, but this is a, so I was given when I started working on the project by my granddad, um, an 1860s book of hours that he had bought at a book fair. Um, and one of the things that I really loved about that, because it was so personal and it had like all these personal writings in it and it had this um, loads of pressed flowers in. Um, and I had this kind of moment in my head that clicked was that I was like, oh, why do you press flowers? It's a way of preserving joy. Um, so that was the, how I kind of developed the images in the book was finding, it's like, what do I do to preserve joy? Um, so it's like saving um, weird little stones that I found on uh, beaches, pressing flowers. This is one of my favorites actually, because this is a, a tiny plastic goat and a lobster claw that I found on the beach in 2010. The plastic goat was inside the lobster claw. 
Um, but it's just like I kind of looked around my studio and I was like, oh, I've got all the stuff that I've saved. Why have I saved this stuff? It's a way of saving memories. It's a way of preserving joys. Um, yeah, and uh, I don't know whether Lucy's put this link in the chat yet or not, but there is a link where you can page through the book online um, and you can see all the images there. And we'll share that again in one instant. Um, and also, I just wanted to sort of mention the the cover as well. Is there anything you wanted to say about the cover? Is this your own embroidery? It is, yeah. So the cover, um, I um, I do a lot of textile work. Um, and in the past, I've done a lot of research into, because I'm a geek, uh, medieval embroidery techniques. And I really love this style called white work, um, which was like really, obviously, if you think how filthy things were back then, pure white stuff was really valuable and it's like white it's white designs embroidered onto um white backgrounds and so when I first envisaged making the book of hours I kind of pictured it with this white work cover that was like quilted with pearls at the point of every um kind of the you know the quilt diamond um and I'd imagined this elaborate motif that was like uh, this is all in that afternoon in 2020, like crossed keys with a bee and a moth to represent like light and darkness. That turned out to be way too complicated <laughs> for me to embroider. Um, but also it didn't kind of fit with how the project developed of it being about like small everyday joys put on that, given that treatment and like tre as sacred. Um, so the text on the cover is embroidered from, I had this, habit in 2020 where I would like write myself a list at the end of every day normally write myself a to-do list but I didn't have a lot to do in 2020 so it became just like a little list of encouragement um so I embroidered one of my lists of encouragement onto the cover and it's quite hard to read but uh it is actually on the back page the text and it says it's easy to forget to do small happy things joy is waiting remember to look It's really beautiful. It's lovely. Thank you. Um, interesting question has come in from Sarah Jane Mason. She says, you use the term blind drawing when describing your plan for your monk-like week. Recently, I heard a conversation around whether that is still an acceptable term to use or if it's ableist. And I wondered if you have any views on that. That's interesting. Um, I had never thought about it. So uh, if anyone doesn't know, blind drawings are these exercises that you often do in your, like your first week at art school where you draw um, without looking at the object. So you draw, uh, and I find them quite meditative. Um, I think you would need to ask somebody who is blind or visually impaired whether they find that term offensive or not. And I would take, uh, maybe we do need to think of a new way of saying it but I would uh I, I'm not blind or visually impaired so I would want to not take that space up thanks if anyone's got any more questions we do have a couple more minutes so get them into the chat but I'm going to take my host's prerogative and ask my question which um so I, I have a residency starting next week and I, your your book resonated with me on lots of levels but one of the things obviously that resonated with me was your kind of aspirations for spending you know a week living like a monk living like a hermit and I have similar I have similar aspirations for my own little residency project and but I suspect very strongly that I'm going to kind of struggle to meet my own expectations on that I just wonder do you have any kind of advice on on that would would you if you were doing that project again or when you do that project again would you set out trying to hold yourself to a really high standard of discipline or would you kind of build in these spaces of you know, <laughs> relaxation, free fall stuff. Um, so before I went on my residency, I just started working with Polly Atkin and she said to me, she's like, you're going to think you're going to be really disciplined, but you're not. And I was like, yeah, we'll see. I'm going to be very disciplined. Um, and she said, give yourself a lot of permission, which I didn't do. Um, so I would try, because I think the weirdest stuff actually becomes productive. So I would never would have imagined in 2021 when I was in sea houses that I would end up putting that stuff about watching the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills into the book but it's become kind of one of the things that was a really good example of me not being disciplined and kind of brought the humor in um so I think you are an artist you can make value out of whatever you do um 
but also I know myself that if I was in that position again I would still have unrealistic expectations because that's the kind of person I'm not going to suddenly start like not having but sometimes having unrealistic expectations gets you halfway and then that's a good place to be so I just think like just just go with who you are and what works for you fantastic so a lot of doom scrolling for me for the next month <laughs> Um, thank you. I mean, I think that's probably, if no one else has any more questions, I think we'll probably pack up there. But it was so great to hear more about the Book of Hours. Thank you again, Letty, for joining us. Um, I know we've had some, uh, some nice comments coming in. Emma Fielder says, I love this so much. Not a question, just a thank you. And I know we're getting lots of little hearts coming up. So I know people have enjoyed this really a lot. If you would like to read or buy the Book of Hours, I've put the links into the chat. I will also send everybody who's attended an email once the video goes live so you can watch again and you can check out the links again if you'd like to get a copy of your own. I do highly recommend getting the, the hard copy. It is really beautiful. Um, lovely for, to, ha to have your company uh, for another Axis Wednesday. As I say, we're going to be on hiatus now until September, but please do remember to sign up for Back to School with Axis. If you're an Axis member, just hold off till you get that email with the special code, but otherwise we shall see you in September. And thank you again for a lovely evening. We'll see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye.